This is Mechanics Multiple Choice 1, AQA examination questions. 35 marks in total. Don't worry about the time saying 38 minutes. These can take a considerable amount of time, can take longer than this, especially when you're new to doing multiple choice questions. So what I shall do is go through the answers, explain each one. And at any point in time, if you wish to attempt the question, which is what I would advise you to do first, is just to pause the video, and then when you want an answer, see if you're correct. Just play it, and I'll explain it. So which one of the following has the same unit as the rate of change in momentum? So the rate of change in momentum, first of all, rate of means divide by time, and of momentum, so momentum divided by time. And the rate of change in momentum... Momentum divided by time is force. It's an equation that you should know. So force is change momentum divided by change in time. And obviously force is measured in newtons. We can just do a quick check. So work is joules. Energy is joules. Acceleration is meters per second squared. Weight is measured in newtons. So the answer would be D. Next question, question two. So the nucleus of a radioactive isotope X is at rest and decays by emitting an alpha particle so that a new nuclei Y is formed. So this is an explosion question, a conservation of linear momentum. So the momentum of Y, which we probably could say goes in this direction, would be equal yet equivalent, sorry, equal yet opposite to the momentum of the half particle, so the half particle would go in the opposite direction. Conservation of linear momentum, A must be the answer. Let's go to the next one. Quite a tricky one, this. We need to know, fundamentally, that the gradient of a velocity time graph is the acceleration. So this says the velocity of a vehicle varies with time as shown by the following graph. The graph below, which graph below, represents how the resultant force F on the car varies during the same time. Let's have a look at this one. So as you can see, up to this midpoint, the gradient is increasing. So that means that the acceleration is increasing and in accordance with Newton's second law, resultant force is equal to MA. Force is proportional to acceleration. So what we have is a, a continuous increase in acceleration, which would indicate a continuous increase in force. Then at the halfway point, we start to get a decrease in the gradient, which means the acceleration is subsiding, which means that if the acceleration is going down in the second half, the force will also go down. And there's only one graph out of A, B, C and D that follows that truth, and that is A, because the force goes up, as indicated by the increasing gradient of the velocity time graph, and then subsequently comes down, which is indicated by the diminishing of this gradient. So, the answer must be A. This next question is to do with efficiency of a mass that's being lifted at steady speed. So, first of all, efficiency, which I'll just call F, is equal to the useful divided by the total. So what we want an electric motor to do is to lift the mass. So the useful would be the gain in gravitational energy, which is mgh. For simplicity, we'll just take g as g to be 10. So the mass is 10 times g, which is 10, times the height. So we don't necessarily have the height, but we do, because the speed is 0 0.5 meters every second. So if we do a snapshot of one second, the distance vertically in one second is 0 0.5 meters. So 10 times 10 is 100 times a half is 50 joules in one second. That's the usefully gained energy. 
Now the electric motor has an input power of 100 watts. And 100 watts simply means 100 joules per second. So we're working with one second. So in one second we have 100 joules. So the useful divided by the total is 50 joules. Usefully transferred divided by the 100 input. Which gives us 0 0.5. And we can times that by 100 to give us 50%. Now, as we move on, we can have a look at question five. Question five, an object falls freely from rest after falling a distance D, its velocity is V. What is its velocity after, after it has fallen a distance 2D? So in this question, the, the key fact on the starting point is that the object falls freely from rest. So what we need is an equation that incorporates velocity and distance. So the one I'm going to use is v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. So if u is 0, because it says at rest, I can get rid of this. So we can say v squared is proportional to 2as, or equal to 2as essentially. But what we're interested in is the relationship between v squared and s. So what we could do is just write this. So if the distance is doubled, what happens to V? Now we could say that we just double this side, but if we did that, we would have to square square the two because the quantity is V squared. So two squared would be four. So that would mean that we have a four on this side and a two on this side, which obviously doesn't add up. So what we need to do is have a thing. And if I multiply by root two, you'll see that root 2 squared would be 2, which means that we have the same quantity on either side of our expression. Therefore, the answer, the only answer, would be D, root 2V. So what we're going to do is move on to question 6. So this question, two masses hang at rest from a spring as shown in the diagram. The spring, string separating the masses is burned through. And we need to calculate the acceleration of each mass. So essentially, this cuts off. So the tension in the spring would be equal to the tension in the string. So the total tension initially would be, well, you've got three kilograms, so three G. When you cut the string, the two kilogram mass would then be in free fall. So it would experience an acce downwards acceleration equal to the gravitational field strength G. So this is essentially gone. So the easiest way I can think to show this is three G minus the G that's been released, so to speak, which would leave us with two G. So the two kilogram mass will just experience G as it's in free fall. So that leaves this one, this one, or this one. Uh, the acceleration of the one kilogram mass will be the remaining two G. So the answer is C. So let's have a look next. We are dealing with number seven. So this question, we've got force of 500 newtons and a speed of 72 kilometers per hour. And it wants work done in five minutes. So if we write work done is force times distance. We know the force is 500. It's just the distance that we need. So it's constant speed at 72 kilometers per hour. So distance would be speed times time. So the speed is 72 kilometers per hour. So the easy, the, well, the quickest way is to just do 72 kilometers per hour divided by 3.6. Now I'll show you where that comes from. So 72 kilometers would be 72,000 meters per hour. Note that it's per hour. So instead of dividing by one hour, we would divide by the number of seconds in an hour. That would be 72,000 
divided by 3,600. And if you put that in your calculator, it would give you 20 meters per second. So that's the speed of this object. And we're going to times it by the time. So I've got 20 meters per second multiplied by five minutes. So five times 60, five minutes times 60 seconds in each minute will be 20 times 300 which gives us a total distance in the five minutes of 6,000 meters. Now we're finished. The work done is the force times distance. So it's the 500 times the 6,000. And if you put that in your calculator, it will give you three times 10 to the six joules. Now it's time to look at question eight. What is the relationship between the distance y traveled by an object falling freely from rest and the time the object has been falling? So to answer this question, we can use S equals UT. Oops, let me just go back on that one. Move it down. So the equation, S equals UT plus a half AT squared. It says in the question that the object is falling freely from rest. So UT would go. And we're left with S equals a half AT squared. And then the question, all they've done is substituted the distance, or the displacement S, with Y. And the time the object has been falling, T, with time X. So we can redraw this. Y equals a half AX squared. The half and the acceleration is just a number. That will be constant. So the relationship, Y, is proportional to X squared. So the answer would be A. So let's move on to question nine. So a ball bearing X of mass 2M is projected vertically upwards with speed U. A ball bearing Y of mass M is projected at 30 degrees to the horizontal with speed 2U. At the same time, air resistance is negligible. Which of the following statements is correct? The horizontal component of Y's velocity is U. The maximum height reached by Y is half that reached by X. X and Y reach the ground at the same time. X reaches the ground first. Now I can see from looking at that question that C would be the answer. Just need to show you why. So the, the mass is irrelevant. You know, the 2M and the and the M is, is you know, insignificant. doesn't matter at all. So the first one is uh, projected vertically with speed U. So as long as we can show that the other ball bearing, ball bearing Y has the same vertical speed, that means that they would reach their maximum height at the same time and come back to the ground at the same time. So, um, the ball bearing Y is projected at 30 degrees to the horizontal, like this, with speed 2U. So what we need to do is resolve this, find out the vertical component and compare it to ball bearing X which is quite straightforward. It's opposite the angle. So it be the magnitude, which is 2u, sine times sine 30, times sine 30. You should know that sine 30 is equal to a half. So half of 2u is simply u. So what we've done is shown that ball bearing x and ball bearing y indeed have the same vertical velocity. So they would indeed reach the ground at the same time. 